Hey guys, welcome to the show. Uh, Keith Reza. Uh, a couple things uh, before we get into it. These are the opening remarks. Alan Lee will not be on the show tonight. He is in New York visiting his mom. And we're still going through the COVID-19. So I said, hey, uh, I don't want to be around you right now. You know, you need that 14 days get away from me. Uh, mode plus he's in New York so uh, yeah and it's ironic because so is our guest we'll, we'll be doing a zoom call and she's in New York so maybe I could have uh, asked Alan to go over to her house and uh, join the fun but I didn't think about that until later anyways but there's a couple of things before we start one my stand-up special is now out Keith Reza make it happen it's on uh, Mad Records, Sony, uh, iTunes, uh, Spotify, subscribe, buy. It's only $10 on iTunes. Buy, rate and review. Tell a friend. Uh, I'm very proud of it. Uh, I worked hard, and I would love uh, for everyone to see it and all that jazz. Um, there is a couple good news. I'm on Cameo. Book me on Cameo, uh, www.cameo.com slash Keith Reza, R-E-Z-A. Uh, for 15 bucks, I'll give you a little shout out, no filter style. Uh, if you have a boyfriend you want to break up with, or a girlfriend, book me on Cameo, I'll do it for you. If you have a significant other you would like to propose to, book me on Cameo, I'll do it for you. In case they say no, it really saves you in the embarrassment of going down on one knee. Uh, I also do birthday shout-outs and all that jazz. Also, I'm on Celebrity Voicemail. You can book me on that as well at www.celebrityvoicemail.com. It'll be fun. Uh, there is some good news right now. Uh, comedy clubs are starting to open a little. And I have a gig in Vegas, uh, June 24th, which is a Wednesday. I'll be at Canchelas Catina. Canchelas Catina. Canchelas Catina. That's where I'll be. And the address is... Oh, shit. What does that say? I will get you the address in one second. I don't want to say that because... The flyer they sent me got weird, like cut, but I will get it right now. Cancellas, Catalina, Vegas. Huh. Great. Just one second. Bear with me, guys. I'm usually more prepared. I got to promote this because I, I it's my first stand-up show and uh it's going to be fun okay well anyways it's spelled c-h-a-n-c-l-a-s canchlas catina c-a-n-t-i-n-a -A. the address i think it says three three two five six east palm n road no that is not the address. 3246 East Desert End Road, Las Vegas, Nevada. The show's at 8 o'clock, but you got to make your reservations and you got to give them a call. And I'm going to get you that number right now, actually, because it's the polite thing to do. Oh, correction, the address is 3246 East Desert End Road, Las Vegas, Nevada. 89121 and their phone number is area code 702-909-7773 again area code 702-909-7773 make reservations for june 24th at 9 p.m to see me on jack slammy's show he's letting me do some time uh i don't think i'm headlining i don't think i'm featuring i think i'm just doing a uh, a guest set, but I would love 
for you to come because it's road work and road work is the best. Uh, I'm very excited actually. It's going to be my first gig in four months. So I'm really excited. Also, Irvine Improv, July 21st. I am headlining Irvine, California, Orange County. Buy your tickets today at www.irvine.improv.com. Uh, they are doing a capacity for social distancing, and it's probably only going to be the first 100, 150 tickets. So buy your tickets today and get a guaranteed spot. Uh, it's going to be a great, great night. I'm excited. I got some great uh, openers like RJ Sains, um, Kenny Weber, Danielle Chukowski, uh the great Mark Brazil might come by. And I'm trying to get the great Kurt Ryan, who's another autistic comic, to come by and do a set. If he is free, it's going to be fun. Uh, that's Irvine Improv. July 21st, Tuesday at 8 p.m. www.irvine.improv.com Also, guys, we need some more love on social media. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, at Reza Riffs, R-I-F-T-S. We got to get those numbers up. And we need some rates, subscribes, and reviews on Apple Podcast. Give us some good news. Give us some reviews. Give us suggestions on how to make the show more entertaining or less entertaining. I don't care. Just do it. Help us out. The more clicking, the better. Um... We have a good guest. I'm excited to bring this guest on. Uh, she's one of my favorite comics. And she has an Amazon Prime special out right now. It's streaming. Which means after this interview, you should go watch it. It's streaming. She also has a comedy special out on Comedy Central. And, you know, she tours with Gabriel Ilgoskis. I'm totally fucking up his name, but Fluffy, you know Fluffy, she tours with Fluffy. And she's one of the best comics out right now, and I'm really excited that she got to uh, do the show. Um, her stand-up special is called The Floor is Lava, and it's on Amazon Prime. So, watch it, give it five stars, and tell a friend to watch it. Let's help her out. Let's get those... Let's get those uh, hits for her, you know? And it'll all be because of Razor Riffs. All right, Rifters, please give me a great warm welcoming for the very funny Gina Brion. And it's going to be fun. Enjoy. You're listening to Razor Riffs with Keith Razor and Alan Lee. Right here on LA Talk Radio. All right. Wait, do I have to wait? If it says it's recording, that means it's recording, right? Yes, it should be. Because I, oh. I usually record my, I do my podcast via Zoom. So when they say, when it says recording, I always assume it's recording. Oh, cool. And I've been right so far. <laughs> oh, how? what's your podcast called? Uh, it's called Mess in Progress. Oh, via Zoom. Via the Zoom, yes. Are you like the first comic to do a podcast via Zoom? Because no, there's. I was a guest on so many that I talked to my uh, the girl that's my co-host and my and my producer Catherine, and I was like, hey, maybe we should just start doing our stuff on Zoom. And since we were doing nothing during the pandemic and we yeah. wanted to have content, we were like, well, let's just give it a try. And we end up really liking it because of stuff like this, where you can talk to somebody that's in another state. Yeah, like, yeah. You don't have to wait for them to be in the same place as you. So it's kind of awesome for that reason. I'm actually very uh, thankful for this whole Zoom thing because, like, I do a lot of phone interviews right now during this pandemic. And it's yeah. really hard because um, I have this thing called Asperger's syndrome. So, like, I can't read energy via phone. But if I see you, I could feel I, – I mean, I still don't see social cues that well, but I could be like, okay, this person's digging my humor, not digging my humor. You know yeah. 
it's hard I, to read that over a phone. I totally get that. Yeah. Yeah. Like I embarrassed myself with Larry Miller, you know, who's like the greatest comic of all oh, time. Oh, Larry Miller. He's a difficult one to read. He's so <laughs> Larry's so hard to read. Oh my gosh. I the first time I met him, I was like, does this guy hate me? <laughs> I was literally just I was in the green room at Comedy and Magic and I was like, I think this guy hates me and I don't even know him. Oh my god. But he's a sweetheart, isn't he? Yeah, he's actually very nice. Yeah. But he can be abrasive too, which can be really hard to read because he's got this abrasive sarcasm <laughs> that like it's hard to read if you if you haven't met him a couple times upon first meeting him, you're like, Whoa, I think this guy really legitimately hates me. Yeah. <laughs> so when I interviewed him, I uh I was like, because I was always taught to call someone by their last name out of respect, you know? Yeah. I was like, is it okay if I uh, call you Larry Mr. Johnson? And that's not his name. His name's Miller. And I was watching the New York Nick uh, flashback where Larry Johnson hit the four point. Oh, gun. no. Okay. Yeah, so I was like, oh, one of my favorite comics hates me. <laughs> you know what? It happens. <laughs> I'm just like, it happens. If He'll get over it. I'm sure he'll get over it where it's just like, ugh. Yeah. Well, it was a few years ago, but I mean, it was just so embarrassing. I was like, ugh. I feel like we hold on to that more than they do. When you look up to somebody and you meet them, like I made it a complete ass out of myself in front of Eddie Izzard. And I was like, he's going to remember this forever. And I'm like, no, he won't. He meets like a million people. He's going to forget about me tomorrow. <laughs> I'm going to remember this forever. <laughs> yeah. Have you ever had that where like uh, you met someone and then like, I don't know, for example, like when you met Fluffy for the first time, did you ever mm -hmm. have that? And then like, when you're like touring with him be like hey do you remember when we first met i was picking my nose or something i made a complete i i was so nervous when i met um gabe for the first time yeah. it was during stand-up revolution and i told him this story um not too long ago and he laughed because he, he was like i don't remember that <laughs> and i was like oh, well, really? this, is, this is how we met <laughs> i was in what i thought was the community green room i thought it was for every comic that was on the show this right. is when he had his show on Comedy Central, um, Stand Up Revolution. I think I was on season three. And I'm, I'm hanging in the green room of the Ontario Improv and in, in walks Gabriel. And I'm like, oh my God, hi, it's so nice to meet you. Thank you for having me on the show. And he's like, thanks for doing the show. And then there's like this awkward moment of silence. And he looks at me and he's like, well, I have to change. <laughs> and I went, oh, this is your green room. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm in I'm in your green room and I, I should go I should go and I left and I was mortified because I was like oh that's not how I wanted to meet him I was infiltrating his green room uh. um, I was so embarrassed and he did not remember that at all he did not remember that story at all yeah. I was like oh, I was the only one that held on to it forever like oh I was mortified now when when this happened were you a headliner or were you still a feature I was headlining, but I was still new. To, I think fairly new to headlining. Yeah, I was yeah. still mainly featuring, I think, at the time when I did Stand Up Revolution, which is why I was, you know, even more nervous. Yeah. Because I was like, oh, my God, like, he was like a national headliner, and I just made a complete jerk out of myself. <laughs> I, I felt like such a nerd. Uh, I would have been like, if I was in that situation, I would have been like, oh, don't change. I love you just the way you are. <laughs> I think you're perfect just the way you are, Gabriel. <laughs> oh, no. Like, I have a weird, sophisticated, awkward sense of humor, so I don't know. But uh, I probably would have giggled if somebody said that to me. Like, if somebody had said that to me, I probably would have laughed because I thought <laughs> I would have thought that was, like, really original and, like, oh, that's charming. I like that. Like, somebody who reacts that way. But I was just like, <laughs> Now, uh, before we started, we were, uh, you were telling me about all these inappropriate pictures you're getting on your fan page. Oh, my God. So on my Instagram, right, when people DM me, if you've never DM'd me before, I have to approve it. Like, I have to accept the DM. Right. And I don't know what it is lately. I'm eight months pregnant, very married, very pregnant. And I have been getting so many inappropriate pictures from men where they're just, they're, they're sharing their junk with me. I don't know why this is happening. I am flattered that this did not happen when I was single. I don't know why, yeah. <laughs> but it, it's happening now. And it's like, thank you. And also 
gross, bro. It's really yeah. gross. It's not a conversation starter. I don't know. No, no. I don't think it is. That's like a three week after the conversation. A- exactly. When <laughs> I request one. Yeah. But I don't know. I kind of think that, like, in a way, in an odd way, it's kind of like a me too in a way because it's something you don't want. You know what I mean? It is kind of like, um, you're digitally sexually harassing me. And yeah. if I was a different person, I would report you. <laughs> <laughs> like I'm, I'm just gonna delete it and accept my trauma from what I've just seen. Yeah. But <laughs> you, sir, that is. Does that has it ever worked where you just on a, you send you send a picture of your junk and a girl's like, you know what, nice job, bro. Yeah, nice well, job. See, I'm actually like kind of proud that I've never done that because I have very small junk, so I'm kind of embarrassed by it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, it's all about angles, hon. It's all about the angle. It doesn't. She's not gonna know. It's it's about how you hold that camera. There are yeah, amazing so. camera angles. Why do you think girls hold their cameras up this way when they're taking selfies? It's it's a much more flattering angle than straight on. Yeah. Oh, uh, so that's why I've never done it because it's like you know I don't want a humiliation fetish over the internet, you know. <laughs> well that's not your fetish i'm sure there are plenty of guys that do have that fetish that are like i don't care <laughs> look at this yeah you know what i never got is like guys do have that fetish it's like a bdsm they'll give a girl like 300 dollars uh so she could beat the crap out of them yeah yeah oh it's weird that's the weirdest thing to me i'm like what that is not to me it's not a pleasurable thing i guess i get it's your thing that's cool let it be your thing but there's nothing about that that I see. And I'm like, oh, that's sexy. Oh. The only thing I don't get is like, why don't you just keep the $300 and ask your mom to do it for free? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, you can get that for free just by pissing somebody off at a bar. I'm just saying, you can save some money. Save exactly. some money, still get your rocks off. <laughs> we, are, we are financial planning for you guys now. <laughs> uh, so your stand-up special just got released on Amazon Prime. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it got released like two weeks ago, right? Yeah, it was um June fifth. I don't know what day it is. We're in. I have no idea. 15. I don't pay attention. I don't pay attention to the to days anymore. <laughs> but yeah, okay. Well, today's the fifteenth. Thank you. So almost um, two days, two weeks, ten days. Yeah, ten days, and it's been the response has been really great. You know, which is all you can hope. Like when something comes out, you're just like please let 90% of the people at least to get it and like it. And, you know, whoever doesn't, you just hope that, and they do, they find you and they let you know how much they hate you as a person and yeah. how you should burn in, in the fiery pits of hell or whatever, whatever thing you've done to offend them, there's always somebody that's going to come at you. But, you know, thankfully the majority of the people have really, they got what the special was about and they enjoyed it, which is all you can really ask for. Yeah. I, uh, I, how long did it take you to film the special? Because I know there's a lot of different, like, for example, my special, it took almost two years just to finish. Normally, I would tell people when they ask me, like, how long it takes to do a special in general, I would say no less than a year. I'm like, I, I feel like no less than a year or you're really taking a risk. And this special was one of those, you're really taking a risk. <laughs> I only yeah. had five months in between projects to write the special wow. and to film it. So this was like nonstop work. This was every night out. If I wasn't um, doing a road gig, I was out every night in the city working out the special in 20 minute chunks. Yeah. Um, And that's the way I had to do it because of the timeline. And that's why I think when it came out, I was just relieved that everybody got it because it was such a labor of love and it was it was really hard on me because it was so much work it was i i put that on my shoulders and i it's something i would never do again but i'm glad that the the special came out and i was really proud with how it came out well you you said you would never do that again uh why not like doesn't don't don't you feel like more stronger now that you did that yes but there's also a part of me that enjoys being able to take my time with things okay and you know, just being a little bit more calculated with 
you know, splitting my time up and planning things. I feel like this was kind of stressful for everybody involved because of the stress I put on myself. That means everybody that I picked to be on my team was also stressed out. Right. Because we only had X amount of time to really get this done. And I'm proud that I did it. And the, the team of people that I was working with, they executed everything beautifully. But I would never want to put that pressure on people again or on myself, even yeah. though I am proud of the fact that we got it done. Yeah. Wait, now, this one's an hour. Your first one was 30 minutes. Did you ever take chunks of your first one into this one so you could, like, breathe a little? Well, my very first one was – the very first one I did early on was an hour. But it's it, that was, like, four or five years ago. And you, like – or even more at this point. You know, you go back and you look at that first hour of material that I had and how long it took to cultivate that material and get it ready. And then the HBO half hour I did, that's why I had five months. I did the HBO half hour. Oh. And then five months later, you know, I was supposed to film this hour for Amazon. And so there was no way I could take anything from that half hour and put it in there. I had to have all new material. There was stuff, though, that was cut from the HBO half hour that I did try to work into the Amazon hour because if okay. it wasn't on HBO, I was like, all right, well maybe it can live over here on, on this special. Yeah. And uh, some of it works, some of it didn't, you know, when you're doing a special, you always plan for X amount of bits to be in the special. You almost go over an hour and then you chop it down to the bits that you know are solid. Yeah. And so we did a lot of chopping it down and like, Oh, this bit never works or, we're still working on the wording and we don't have time to concentrate on that. So like different things were pulled that will hopefully make it into the next project. It's funny how you say like on an hour special, you, you always want to do like an hour, 10 minutes so they could trim it because on my special, the director told me the exact same thing. Like I was preparing for an hour, you know what I mean? Just an hour done. Cause I don't believe in cuts and stuff. Cause if anything, I could just add a laugh track. You know what I mean? Well, you always can. And for some <laughs> things, you want to sweeten it because maybe the audience didn't quite get it. And you're just like, oh, but I love that bit. I don't want people to not yeah. get the punchline because the audience missed it. There's stuff that people will quote from that special and from the HBO Half Hour that I feel like the audience didn't fully get. But the people at home watching, they got it and they quote it. And yeah, I mean, people are always ashamed to be like, oh, well, laugh tracks. But there's certain times when you're like, I know people laughed more at that bit because I was on stage. So yeah. that needs to be louder because I, I remember it from being on stage. Yeah. And like with my special, I'm very proud of it. But when they told me I had to do an hour, 10 minutes, I was like, honestly, I was like, I only have 55 minutes of material. <laughs> yeah, I think mine was, um, was a little bit over an hour and we got it down to about 57. We oh. cut it down to about 57 minutes that um, the network and I were comfortable with. Yeah. That I was like, all right, 57, I can deal with. And then the credits and every, all right, fine. Yeah, yeah. So that, that's probably the same time as mine. But I remember I was like, okay, they want an hour t when I'm actually filming. Because I only shot it in one take, you know. Oh, wow. That, yeah. see, that is impressive. That is <laughs> very impressive to do an hour in one take. I think that my first special we had to do in one take, uh, like just an hour. And then. We redid, I think, one bit all the way at the end. They were like, come back out and just redo this bit. But that's, uh, that's impressive, man. Yeah. And um, it's like the reason why I have the material is because like I, I used to tour with Norm MacDonald and Jeremy Hunt. He's great. Oh, yeah. You know? So I, I will admit that I don't have an hour. I'm just a goofball. You know what I mean? And I'm very proud of it. But like – because now I'm just now bumping over feature where I'm just like, just headlining the off nights. So I don't, that's where it starts. Off. Yeah. Yeah. And I think a lot of comics, like, especially now, maybe not now because of the COVID-19, but a lot of comics, I feel they just want to rush into the headlining spot. Oh, you know? so many people, everybody wants to be a headliner until they're a headliner. Yeah. And then when you're a headliner, you realize that the pressure's on your shoulders and it's an immense pressure because you are expected to execute. You are yeah. expected to get up there and deliver and deliver for 45 minutes to an hour, depending on what the venue is, depending on what time. Yeah. And everybody wants to rush there. Everybody wants to rush because they think, oh, I, I, I so deserve to be a headliner. I can headline. I totally can headline. 
because a good headliner will make it look like a cakewalk. Yeah. A good headliner will make it look so easy that people that don't really understand how comedy works, like I headlined way too early in my career. Yeah. You know, the first time I headlined, I bombed so bad that I was like, I'm not headlining until I'm ready. Like oh. they gave me a headlining spot way too early and I just wasn't prepared to handle the situation. And I waited, I waited a long time before I ever even thought of headlining again. I was like, I won't do it. I, I accepted feature work. I accepted work as an opener, as a host, everything I could until I felt ready to headline. Uh, how, how many years in were you when you first, like when you got that first headlining gig? I was probably about, I want to say about four or five years in oh. and they gave me a headlining gig and I was just like, yeah, I'm totally ready for this. And you know, and it wasn't about the material. I had enough material, but what I did not have was the confidence. Yeah. What I did not have was the ability to control a room of people if shit got crazy yeah. and shit got crazy yeah. you know i didn't know how to turn a situation around if a crowd hated me and i had to be on stage for 45 minutes yeah and is it like more difficult uh when you have like bad openers it can be yeah because what happens in, and you have to think like an audience member yeah, Unless yeah. you are a Kevin Hart or a Bill Burr or a well-known comic and they know who they're coming to see, 90% of the time your headlining work is a bunch of people that came to that club because they wanted a night out. They right. don't really know who's the headliner. They don't really know you. They don't know your work. Some of them maybe Googled you, but there's more of a chance that they just got free tickets and showed up. Yeah. And so the audience mentality when like, let's say the host sucks. And then the feature sucks. Well, they're like, well, this just seems bad all around. And we don't even know who this headliner is. So now there's more of an expectation when you get on that stage. They're almost expecting you to suck and hoping to God that you don't because then they feel like they've wasted their money. Right. So when you have to go up there and pull the crowd up from, from them being disappointed just for, for two performers, it adds that pressure. And if you're not used to that, like, you'll drop the ball right away because that pressure, that intimidation of a crowd looking at you, like, make me laugh. Yeah. They're, yeah. Not, they're not welcoming. Yeah. So you need a whole lineup that's strong. This might be, like, a scary question to ask, but when you were first starting, did any headliners, like, ever go up to you and say, look, I don't want you to be funny? No, but I was told things like, um, could you not do this particular bit because right. I have something similar? Or could you not do any crowd work because I do crowd work? Yeah. You know, stuff like that I was told. And as ridiculous as it is, like, I respected it when I was told that because I was just like, okay, you're the headliner. I respect it. Right. Um, but as I matured in comedy, I never did that to anybody. Yeah. I never pulled any of my comics. So the most I said to my comics was, um, if they can keep it PG-13 clean. And that's only because I know the people that do know me and do come out to see me know that I usually work clean. But right. I also tell the people that come to see me, I don't control the other comics on the show. They are allowed to do whatever they want to do. So if that offends you, you have to understand, I have no control about it. You can't, you know, email me or email the club and complain about them. They, are, they have the right to do their set the way they want to. Yeah. So oh I just God. try to ask them to just, if you can PG 13, but do you, but get up there and do you. I wish, uh, I wish Debbie Gutierrez told me that when I opened for her. She's oh no. Like, yeah, she's like a really clean comic. And then she goes dirty, like on the last 15 minutes of her act. Yeah. And she, uh, when I opened up for her, like I was, cause like, I was like such a huge fan and she finally said, yes, I could open up where I was like, Oh my God, I'm going to do my best stuff. And I did my best stuff, but she had a tough time following me. You know what I mean? And, uh, I think your styles are very different. Like I know Debbie, she's a good friend and her style, she's got a real specific style. And if your styles are different and mm -hmm. like you're killing with your style and then a comic comes up and does their style, even yeah. if they can maintain the room or they can, you know, get the crowd on their side, yeah. knowing where the crowd's humor lies. Like I've worked with guys before where 
I'll watch them and I'll be like, oh my God, this crowd is going to hate me. <laughs> they, they love this guy or they love this girl and they're, they're going to absolutely, they're going to think I'm terrible. I've had that night happen. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I don't know, like with me, because like I, I think that you should always do, because that's the one thing Norm taught me. He Like he told me probably the first gig that I ever opened up for him. He's like, you know what? I want you to be fun- the funniest you've ever been every single show because you're never going to be funnier than me. And like that, like that trained me. You know what yeah, I mean? That's a, that is such a, I mean, man, what a smart thing to say to somebody because the fact is, and Norm McDonald, you know, when you have your set audience, when you have people that know you, when you're a known name like Norm, you know, you know the audience is there for you. Right. They are your crowd. They want your humor. They want your cadence. They want your material. They are there for you. So there's very little fear in is my feature, is my host going to do better than me? Yeah. When you know how to ride the wave of funny people where it's like, oh, the host was amazing. The feature was amazing. And now it's the headliner's time. Like, wow, this guy knows how to ride that wave of funny, funny, funny. And keeping it really in the, in that you know that really tight a really tight show and that that's why i love comedy because like that's why i love the shows where like i think that it should be just going up 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 and yes. that's why i don't like i want like it's my dream to be a national headliner like you someday but like i'm not ready because i could go up 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 and then i'll have if you know depending who's better if i can't follow them that <laughs> That's always the fear, I think, though, like, you know, even, I mean, there's two types of fear when you're headlining, when you go to a room, like when I'm headlining and I don't get to bring my own feature or host, like people that I know are solid and funny and get the job done, it's, it's like, okay, I don't know if the club is going to pick people that are, you know, local that they don't have to pay much to, so they're not worried about if they're talented, or people that they love that are going to destroy with whatever material they know this crowd loves. And then I'm going to come up as a brand new someone they don't know and have to win them over. Meanwhile, this person murdered. So there's a lot of fears when you go to like a new club as a headliner, especially as one who's not in like the Kevin Hart position where people are, are coming out just to see you where it's like, Oh man, like there are certain markets where I know I have enough of a fan base that they'll come out to see me. You know, if I'm doing Arizona or Colorado or like, you know, certain parts of Florida, like, I know that people are going to come out to see me and that's very comforting, but it's still, still nerve wracking because it could go any way. You could have a feature that blows you out of the water. And that's just, that happens. That's how people learn to become headliners. Do Do you get off when that happens? Like, like, I get excited because I feel like the crowd gets comedy. Yeah. You know, the only time that I'm disappointed is when, in, in my opinion, I'll watch a comic and he or she is getting off doing easy comedy. Right. And I'm like, this person now thinks they're a genius, but they just lucked out and this crowd happened to like the fact that they can go for the, the basic ABCs of comedy. They right. haven't pushed themselves. They haven't grown from that first level comic. Now... Like, I'm probably guilty of this. I probably have uh, easy comedy subjects that I talk about, like dating, you know? Well, subjects are one thing. What people need to understand about comedy, too, is that, like, we're all going to have the same subjects. We're all living life. You know, we've all experienced pretty much the same things. You know, we've experienced losses. We've experienced wins. We've, you know, break up, you make up, you get married, you get divorced, you have kids, you don't have kids, you party, you don't party. We're all going to have similar premises. What's more important than what the premise is, is your point of view coming out in the punchline. Right. So that's the important part. It's not like I'll hear a hundred jokes about dating, but you'll hear a joke from Bill Burr about dating and you'll go, I never thought of it that way. Yeah. I don't mean to change the subject, but do you do all your Zoom interviews in this room? <laughs> this is my bedroom. Yeah. Uh. Um, Yes, because the lighting is best in this room <laughs> uh. and because it's the most private room. So it's like, I kind of have to like have it be qu- quiet. The bed's usually a lot more made, but I took a nap. 
so the, the bed's a little unruly right now because mama <laughs> needed a nap well no because i was just thinking because here you are giving me great advice and then i see your door i'm like oh god what if her husband walks in <laughs> if he did usually i lock the door but i didn't so you, you might you might walk in we might get a special guest so I was gonna like trick you. I was big, I was gonna say, by the way, your husband's a good looking man. And then be like, <laughs> you would have seen my face just go like <laughs> you would have seen my angry face like he knows I'm on a zoom. <laughs> Why would he walk in here? So uh you're you're having a, a child. Is this your first one? Yeah, it's my first one, man. My first my first baby. Is it gonna be a boy or a girl? A boy. I'm having a little boy. I'm gonna teach him not to send pictures of his wiener to people. <laughs> that's what I'm gonna be like. Hey, don't don't do that. That's that's in a, no girl likes that unless she requests it. And then be very careful. She might be playing a trick on you. Yeah. <laughs> Have you <laughs> thought of any good names yet? We had a couple of lists of names before deciding on the one. We decided with on the name Jaden, um, but we went through like a list of names, and my husband wanted like a certain name, and I was like, huh. I'm carrying the baby, so I have say. <laughs> Over when you're carrying it and you can give birth to it, then you can name the baby. Jaden's a good name. It's yeah. also unique. There's not a lot of Jadens right now. Yeah, I dig it. J for short. You know what I mean? Like, I dig it. Little baby J. <laughs> you know, uh, I don't know if you know this, but my mom named me Keith. <laughs> I I would have never known. I'm so glad I'm so glad you told me. I will take that secret to my grave. <laughs> but uh, but no, but I'm excited. You know, I think uh, I think your your material is also your material is already A plus. But I think when you have the uh, Jaden, your material is going to go higher. Yeah, it's you know so crazy, mean? like how much you're just even now, how much my life is changing because of like being pregnant I never would have I never would have thought like I, if, when I thought about having kids I was like I like kids but I hated the idea of giving birth I've always hated the idea of giving birth right I just it petrifies me to this day still scared absolutely shitless about giving birth yeah. but um when I got pregnant the things I learned about pregnancy and mind, mind you my pregnancy's been freaking amazing like oh, really? no morning sickness no nothing i am apparently carrying an angel um which just means when he's born he'll probably be the worst person in the world <laughs> he'll probably just be a little terror when he's born because he's been so good the whole pregnancy right but i've had an amazing pregnancy and all i ever heard were these horror stories about pregnancy about being sick all the time and all these things that happen to your body and i was like well i'm kind of sailing along here being fine <laughs> <laughs> i don't uh I don't know what you guys are talking about. This has kind of been awesome <laughs> and <laughs> kind of fascinating because, like, oh, weird stuff happens to your body. Like, your organs move because the baby is growing, so there has to be room inside of you. That was the freakiest part, like, knowing that my organs are now pushed up and out. You're right. And it's so creepy, but also it's like a science experiment, so I'm fascinated by yeah. everything. By everything that's happening to my body, I'm fascinated by it. You know, uh, you, you were talking about morning sickness, not having any. I found out what morning sickness is at a very young age because really? I, didn't, I didn't know that it was something only girls could have. So, like, one time I was trying to ditch school and I wrote, I hand forged a note and I said, please forgive Keith. He suffered morning sickness. Oh, Keith. Oh, Keith. Oh, Keith. <laughs> and, uh, I think that's when I knew I wanted to be a comic. <laughs> <laughs> if I was the teacher, I would have been like, morning sickness. Okay, well, let's just give this kid the day off because he's hilarious. <laughs> he well, should just I, get this day off. Well, I also signed the note, uh, the president, because I figured who's going to call the president? <laughs> that is hilarious. I hope my son does something like that. This, no, this note's from the president. Oh, <laughs> Well then, we yeah. should, we should not question it at all. You were absolutely right. You definitely do have morning sickness, sir. Yeah, but but the detention lady was like, she scared the crap out of me because she picked up the phone, dialed the number, 
And she's like, yes, uh, is the president here? So I thought oh she called God. the White House. <laughs> oh, my God. She was an evil genius, that woman. Yeah. Like, oh, my God. Like, but I noticed that those are the people that I'm drawn to, you know? Yeah. I mean? So, but uh, I think that life experiences like that, you know, because I'm a kid with autism just trying to skip school because I already knew school before I went to school. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, that's the powers of autism. Yeah, my ne- my nephew's son is high functioning, and he's so. I feel like this kid is just ahead of the game. Every time I talk to this kid, I'm just like, I I I'm like, you're just brilliant. <laughs> like, yeah. it's no wonder school frustrates you because you're you're so ahead of it. Like, it's like you get it right away, and you're like, no, there's no reason for me to sit here day after day and hear this stuff. I got it the first time you told me. Yeah, like it's it's pretty amazing. I mean, uh, before this pandemic happened, I've been like. Because most of my comedy is talking about like what it's like being autism and like how like I'm smart and stuff. I was working on this bit on how, you know how everyone's saying Trump's the worst president in US history and all that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't like getting political, but that's not a true statement. The worst president in US history was the ninth president, William Henry Harrison, because he was only president for 30 days and he accomplished nothing but pneumonia. When you look at it, when you look at his track record, you're like, well, technically, what do you mean by the worst? <laughs> so like, I've been working on like bits on that where like every president, I want to have like 10 minute bits so I could have a 42 hour special. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cause it's like, you can say he's awful, but is he really the worst? <laughs> like, is he awful? Without a doubt. Yeah. But <laughs> if we're going by track record alone, <laughs> There were people that were worse before him. <laughs> like that one guy who was only in office for two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> remember that guy? No, no one does. Yeah, you don't remember one. him. I do. <laughs> now, uh, another question I had is, uh, uh, to being a female uh, headliner, what's it like working on the road? Like, do you ever get, like, horror stories where, like, your your pay is not that good or they're kind of, like, be asking you a little about numbers oh we're drastically underpaid but right. that's just a hazard of the business where it's just like you know you can only fight for so much until you become such a name that you can like it doesn't i'm sure it doesn't happen that much with angela johnson you know what i mean like i'm sure she can walk into a club and you know this is the price you pay for angela johnson that's it there's no question about it yeah but with a lot of female headliners it's like yeah that's the that's the price you pay. Cause I know that's the only price you're going to pay for me. Right. And it's, it's frustrating and it's a battle. And my, as your stock goes up as a performer, your price goes up and you just have to go to the clubs that are willing to honor that new price. And, you know, sometimes you miss out on a lot of clubs because pe- clubs will be like, well, we're not paying that much for you. And you go, well, it's been real. Thank you so much. And I appreciate the work you've given me in the past but you have to set the bar for how you're treated as you climb up the ladder in this business. Yeah. The, the reason why I ask is cause like I'm going through something similar where like I, and honestly I'll work for cheap. I just want to make people laugh. Yeah. But at the same time, there's no reason that like, you know, guys like Bruce Jingle should make twice as much as me when I'm a better comic. You know what I mean? Well, there are certain things that you, you know, you can try to argue on merit, but like a lot of clubs just go by. It's so weird with so many clubs because some of it is personal bias. Like I've worked with guys where I've been like, I've worked with features that open for me. And I'm like, why is this guy doing close to a headlining set? Like he should only be doing 20 to 25 minutes. And they're like, well here he does 35 to 40 before the headliner. And I'm like, why? Because he's a club favorite, because he's their favorite. So you're dealing with favoritism on one end. You're also dealing with who brings in more people. And that can be such a weird game to play. Because sometimes the people that bring in more people aren't necessarily big names. They just market well, and they know how to get people in the seats. And they call in favors, and they do whatever. And that's tricky to a booker, because it's like, even if I don't think this guy's funny, the fact that he packs the house or I don't think this person's a good person because I've worked with people that are just horrible human beings, but because they can bring people in and get butts in the seats, it doesn't matter how terrible they are. They're selling out the club every weekend they do. Right. 
So it's such a battle. I I think that uh, when people want to be a comic, I think that's one of the things that they should take in school is marketing. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. You know? Because it, I never took a marketing class and I'm, I'm a terrible marketer. And I think if I had any skill in marketing, I think my career would be maybe not way better, but it would definitely be better. Yeah. It would be a lot easier. I think if we all had more of a knowledge of marketing, because I feel like for a lot of comics, um, we learn as we go. Right. We learn from other comics. We learn what works for us. We try all the tricks of the trade that we know, email lists, shouting out your social, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And the trick is to get all of your social media followers to translate to ticket sales. So it's great if you have a, a thousand or more followers, but can you get a thousand or more people into the shows? Yeah. And you, have you ever run into someone who like just buys followers like off the internet? Not anybody that would admit it. <laughs> right. Like, I'm like... Ugh. But a couple of suspected people where I'm like, it, they just do it so that they look good. But you can always tell those people, here's the telltale sign of somebody who's bu buying followers. Their ticket sales never translate. Right. They never translate. If you have 250K followers, but every time I've worked with you in a club, there's like 10 people there to see you, there's a good chance that all that the majority of your followers were bought. And those 10 people were only there to see me. Exactly. <laughs> those 10 people were your personal <laughs> friends and they liked me better. Yeah. <laughs> like next time I won't give you the pleasure of tagging you on the retweet. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh man. Uh, another, the last question I had is, uh, are you, uh, actually I have two more questions if I can. Yeah. I'll ask this one first. Uh, are you writing like a sitcom around your life right now? It's funny. Yeah. I, I'm actually working on a show um, with uh, my team of people that I'm really excited about. And I can't say much about it other than we are working on a sitcom. These things take time. And I think I've been through this process before and people people rarely get to see the part of the process that's repetitive. Like so many comics get to the point where they're writing a show and they're pitching a show and then that falls through and then they start writing a new show and they start pitching a new show and then that falls through. And it takes a, a few times before it actually hits. It's very rare that your first show that you write and you pitch goes through. Right. And if it does, it's like everybody's super impressed because they're like, wow, that show must have been so that that show must be a hit if if you're walking into the room and they're buying it right from the start and so the process i've been through it like two or three times before the pitching process and so you learn to just take everything with a grain of salt you know yeah. this is the thing i can enjoy is the creative process of setting up a show when it comes to the pitching process that gets a little nerve-wracking because you know you're in the room with executives and you're trying to pitch them your idea and some of them are just stone faced and you have no idea if they like it or not. Like we pitched a show to executives once. And I remember it was me and my team and we walked out of that meeting and everybody was just like, man, we suck. We were just like, that was terrible. They didn't, they didn't laugh. They didn't they seemed so serious. And we got a phone call the next day that they wanted to buy the show. Oh, that's awesome. You just never, you just never know. I mean, and that deal fell through like that. And that's the thing. You get the phone call and you go, yeah, great. And then that deal falls through and you're like back to square one. Right. Which again is why everything with a grain of salt. I don't ever get too excited about anything until cameras are rolling and we filmed and it's a definite going to air. Yeah. That's the only time I get excited because everything else is subject to change. Well, because like one of my dreams is I always want to like, uh, I also want to write on a sitcom, just write, you know what I mean? I don't really care about, I mean, obviously I want to do acting, but I just want to just throw the jokes and you know what I mean? The writer's room is a fascinating, like, I know a couple of comics that like Pete Corrielli was a writer on uh, Kevin Can Wait. Um, yeah. So was uh, Michael Loftus, both comedians out of New York and like, it's you're talking like 12 hour days where you're in the room with the writers going back and forth uh, with ideas with the show creators sometimes when it was Kevin can wait with Kevin himself sitting in the room and you're throwing ideas back and forth and so it's such a demanding job being in the writer's room but I feel like 
any comic could benefit from the experience. Yeah. Like just sitting in that writer's room, learning how to tell a story. Even if the show goes nowhere or gets canceled or whatever, you've had that experience under your belt as a writer. So now when you go to write your story, you have a better understanding of what television people are looking for. Yeah. And I mean, I just like, I just think it would be cool just to have some of my jokes on something there. I could say, Hey, look, because I, yeah, I wrote for uh, Norm's podcast and I submitted like every week I submitted like 30 to 40 jokes and only one joke made the entire show. And I remember when that joke made it, uh, I was just like, wow. You know what I mean? And it was when Sinbad was going through that, uh, tax invasion thing uh-huh yeah and i was like so it looks like things for sinbad got sin worse <laughs> that's a good one that's a cute one yeah. that's really cute i like that and see that's a that's the part i think that for writers is such a win like what that reminds me of was i had a friend who uh, always wanted to write for late night shows and so like submitting for late night is like that when you you know when you submit your monologue jokes for a Jimmy Fallon or for a Jimmy Kimmel and and you're just like please at least take one like you yeah. submit like you submit like a hundred bits and you're just like just take one yeah. like these are all funny to me but just please pick one and then you get that one bit on there and you're like that that's a win that's a win yeah and uh, like I gotta tell you I thought all a lot of my other jokes were better. And it's weird because, like, I'm the biggest Sinbad fan. So when I interviewed him, I did not mention I said that joke, you know? <laughs> <laughs> You're like, that's a good idea. That's a very smart idea, Keith, where it's like, don't, don't, don't tell him you did the sin, the sin worse joke. Don't yeah. tell him. <laughs> he, might, he might not take it as well as you think he's going to take it. I was like, that, that's how you get unfollowed by Sinbad on Twitter. <laughs> yeah, that's real. You get unfollowed real quick as soon as he finds out you did that bit. And then uh, one of the last questions I had is, um, what's it like uh, when you're touring with Fluffy? Like, what are uh, words of advice? Like, I mean, I give you an example of what Norm told me, always oh, yeah. be funny. Like, because obviously going with Fluffy has made you a stronger comic as well. Oh, yeah. he's He's got, I think the way I learned from him the most, is not just through our conversations, because he's an incredibly giving and wonderfully humble human being. Like, He's just one of the most amazing people to sit down and have a conversation with, um, which is so, he's so shockingly humble as a, as a performer, as, as a mentor, as somebody to work with, but like also just watching him perform. I learned a lot, the way that he works a stage, the way that he, like every stage I've seen him perform on, he makes it his home. It's the most amazing thing you've ever seen because when you do that in a comedy club, that's an achievable goal. When you do that in an arena, when you make a place that has 20,000 seats in it feel like a small, intimate club, he can pull that entire room in with just his performance. And I, I would sit there and I'd watch him and I'd just be in awe of how he does that, how he navigates around the stage and just uses everything to his advantage. And that gave me, you know, the, the freedom to sort of take that chance when I'm on stage and be up there and be like, okay, well, I know I'm scared out of my mind because there's a lot of people here. And if I look up, I'm probably going to throw up, but <laughs> I'm going to work this stage. I'm going to walk around more. I'm not going to stay in one place and let my nerves get the best of me. I need to explore the stage. That stage needs to be my home, just like Gotham Comedy Club or the Comedy Cellar or my home. Yeah. And learning that from him and, you know, he would ask me, you know, when we did, I think, I forget what arena we were at, but he asked me, um, how did you feel being on that stage? And I was like, you know, I only looked at the first four rows of people and then halfway through my set, I looked up. And in my head, I went, oh, shit. And then I looked back down because I was like, there's so many people. But if you don't get in your head about it, if you don't let the fact that there's so many people out there get to you, then you stay in that pocket of this is my home. This is where I belong. Everybody is going to get it. Everybody can see me on this stage. Everybody can feel what I'm saying. And learning that from him is probably one of the biggest lessons, just learning how to work that stage and make it my home even when it's on a grander scale of being in an arena. 
Because that can be so intimidating. Now, uh, when your time comes to be the main person in the arena, like, are Ooh. you going? Are you going to tell your openers and features the the exact same advice on how to handle it? Yeah, I think my I would pull them aside and I would literally tell them, you know, this is what Gabriel taught me, and so I want to pay it forward. One of the things that um, one of my favorite Gabriel stories about paying sort of paying it forward was I was working with him. And I had a really crappy cell phone that only worked if I plugged it in the wall. And <laughs> no, it wasn't. Although the flips did suck. Um, I, it was like an old iPhone and it just wasn't working anymore. And I, you know, you don't make that much money as a comic, although everybody thinks we're always swimming in money for some reason, because we work in entertainment. And, you know, Gabe was like, why don't you just get a new phone? And I was like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get a new phone. Just not right now. Right now, I just, I only use it when it's plugged in the wall. It's a system that works. And that night, he gave me a new iPhone, like a brand new iPhone 5, I think, or whatever. And I cried because I was like, I, I can't ever pay you back for this. Like, I can't, I can't even take this because if I take this, I can't pay you back for it. And he said, the only way that you could pay me back for this is when you have a chance to do something nice for someone like this, you do it. Oh. And and that stuck with me. That right. stuck with me. So whenever I have a chance to help out a comedian or to help someone out that's in the business, I take it because I remember those words of like, even if it's just advice, even if it's just somebody hitting me up, asking me advice. I'm like, I'm always open to that. Like, oh, I will give you advice. I'll watch your videotapes. I'll, I'll help you out in any way because I think paying it forward in this industry is really important for the people that are the next people coming up. Yeah. Well, I can't wait to open up for you so I can get a cell phone. <laughs> you're, now you're expecting one. You're going to be like, um, so Gina, on my writer, I did put a cell phone. <laughs> <laughs> I did put, get me a cell phone. <laughs> well, Gina, I, uh, I uh, want to respect your time, but I, I, I want to say this from the bottom of my heart. I know like you get a lot of interview requests and uh, thank you for letting, you know, just talking to me. I mean, I know we've only met a couple times, but, um, you know, I really do appreciate it. It was fun. And I, I feel like, you know, I feel we're going to be friends forever. With yeah, that. this was really fun. And I really hope that next time I'm out in Cali that we can, we can hang out or next time you're in New York, if you come out here, let me know for sure. All right, Gina. Well, have a good yeah. night and, uh, you know, good luck. And I'm going to watch your special and I love you. Oh, thank you so much. I love you too, buddy. And I'll talk to you next time. And you take care of yourself. And I will see you next time I'm out in Cali. All right. Bye, Gina. Bye, hun. All right. Cool, guys. So I just save this. Do I save it? Stop recording. Stop recording. Okay. I don't know how to stop this recording. This is an interview over Zoom. Should be easy. I wonder if pause works. I'm so confused. Okay. This is a uh, part of the show where I have to call Catherine. So guys, uh, bear with me. Because I'm calling Catherine, my sister. Yes, child. Hey, uh, so I finished my interview on Zoom. Do I hit stop or pause? If you're done, press stop. Okay. So do I hit end? Yeah. Okay, cool. All right, thank you. Yep. Wait, 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 do I hit stop video? Stop video just turns your camera off, so you need to end the meeting. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you. If you stop your video, Zoom will still be going on. Oh, okay. But if I hit end, it'll send me the file, right? It'll send me the video, yeah. What about the audio? Well, obviously, the audio will be part of the video. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye. That was my sister, Catherine. Okay. Uh, that was Gina, uh, uh, Brion guys, follow her on social media and support her and, uh, subscribe, rate, review, raise the riffs.
And uh, thank you guys so much. Have a great night. You're listening to Razor Riffs with Keith Razor and Alan Lee right here on LA Talk Radio.